Hello everyone, so this is like my fourth try on this video. So basically another intern asked me, hey Charles, can you give me some recommendations on uh, rotating in the wards? Because yeah, I haven't rotated in the wards and I'm going to rotate there. So this friend of mine, fellow intern, is starting tomorrow in the wards. So I just, I'm just starting my own ba like week long vacation. But I think it's important to do this video because I know that maybe this video could help you out. Maybe you will end up seeing it. Maybe you have some feedback. Maybe you can improve uh, the content of this video. So I'll try to make it quick. I've already tried to do this four times and I suddenly start talking and go on a tangent as I usually do. So I know you don't like um, me talking too much. So let's be concise. So basically in summary, in Latin America, the wards are the same as saying salon, in case you're in the Latin American context. And what are the wards? These are patients that are admitted from the emergency department and aren't in the ICU, basically, in summary. So if they aren't in the ICU, it means usually they are not intubated, at least in the United States. They are not intubated, they are not requiring vasopressors, they are not requiring um, vital signs check every two hours or yeah they are not requiring all those things so usually they are s stable patients right but of course your patient might change in from one hour to the next it doesn't mean you can just lay there and your patients will be fine it means that you have to pay attention and that your patients might become unstable and maybe you will have to contact the icu or your patient might even go into a code and suddenly you, you have to go run and start uh, the code blue and all that, right? Okay, so what are the recommendations for rotating in the wards? Okay, it's, it's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be, yeah, very interesting because this is one of the places you have a wide variety of things to see. So in the wards, in our scenario, we are internal medicine. So you might be have, have a patient with diabetes, the other one with Hodgkin's lymphoma, the other one end stage renal disease. So it means that you'll have a lot to learn, a lot to do. So you won't have answers for everything day number one. And even if you have already graduated, you will always have questions. So even the attendance, have questions on a daily basis so we cannot think we will know everything what we have to understand is that this is constant learning and this is the only way through it so yeah you'll have a lot of uh, questions the good thing in the United States is that you can say I don't know I'll find I'll figure it out and it's usually well accepted uh, but in other contexts, in Latin America, you can't say, I don't know. You have to usually make something up or just uh, act as if you have to go to the bathroom real quick and then uh, get into the internet in the bathroom and then come back uh, reciting um, medicine, right? So understand that you won't know everything, that you have to understand and start learning how to triage because you might have five patients one day, you might have eight patients another day. So how to be a good intern? This is, goes mainly to interns because if you're a second year, this video probably you have already gone through it. So you might be seeing this and you're like been there, done that. So this will be way more significant for an intern or a medical student that is like, hmm, I'm going into that rotation. I want to know a little bit about what this guy has to say, right? So, in summary, triage. How, how do you triage? So, for the wards and for everything in medicine, right? But for the wards, you have to know how to triage. So, you have to be sure you give the vital signs the importance they deserve. That's why they're called vital, right? So, whenever you're seeing patients, let's say you have six patients and all of them are new. So you have to, first of all, get there on time for the sign out and listen to the story. Okay, this patient has this. I'm going to have this new patient. And if you have questions, you can ask the sign out team. So I would recommend you to ask all the questions necessary. Um, 
Some questions might be important, some questions might not be important, but the only way you will figure it, this out as an intern is if you ask them. If you just stay with your mouth shut there, sitting down and not asking anything, it, eventually you won't be able to determine and filter out is this question clinically relevant or not because that's something important that you will gather with time and time will give you the experience but if you don't ask anything there won't be any experience right so I would recommend you to pay attention to that uh, sign out pay attention to all those characteristics so if you hear okay this patient has atrial fibrillation and uh, the patient's medications are aspirin, a statin and, and, and such other medication and uh, aspirin, statin and metformin. So you might be thinking atrial fibrillation, anticoagulation, yes or no? They didn't mention anything about the CHADS VASC, right? So you could ask the sign out team uh, like isn't, why isn't this patient on anticoagulation? Should they be on anticoagulation? And they might be like, hmm, now that you say that, we were thinking, we, yeah, we didn't calculate the CHADS VASC. So that's something you can write down, okay? CHADS VASC, let them go because it's not their deal. They want to sign out and they want to go home. And then you'll calculate, okay, CHADS VASC is this. Oh, two points, yeah, three points. We have to anticoagulate and maybe aspirin won't be in the mix. So that's what I'm saying by whenever you have a question, instead of just saying, st sitting there and being like, hmm, and letting them go, ask. You have to ask. Even I understand that you sometimes don't want to ask things because it might be seen as uh, he's an intern. He shouldn't be asking anything. That's the only way to learn and that's the only way your patient will actually improve. So yeah, you gotta ask. Okay, so pay attention to that sign out. That will be great. If you can, the day, now that we have Epic, Epic access to this digital files and everything, if you have that and you're starting tomorrow, for example, or you know you have uh, admissions overnight and you'll see them tomorrow and you're having a hard time um, so before the night before just get in there and read a little bit about the patient oh we have this new patient and they're thinking what's this okay reticulocyte index less than two percent um, what, what do I do with that oh the patient has anemia what oh this means hyperproliferative so it, what should I send this patient tomorrow labs for hemolysis no, because it's hyperproliferative. So the problem is in the bone marrow. Okay, so tomorrow I might ask, can we send a vitamin B12 assay, a folate assay, this and that, okay. So I'm not saying just go crazy the night before. You have a life as well, so remember that medicine is great, but you can't leave your family uh, on the side, right? You have to you have a life out of the hospital so yeah dedicate a little bit of time that's why I'm doing these videos real quick I'm doing them quick I don't want to edit them much because I'm not editing these videos if I do that I'm not gonna be with my wife I am not gonna uh, enjoy the evening so you have to start working on this and try to be efficient with your time here and there if you don't have a hard time for example I already have experience in Costa Rica so yeah, if I have an admit overnight oftentimes I just get there and listen to the sign out and I'll start working from there because I already know and I've already seen this in the past several times so I probably won't have to review it the night before but everyone has their rhythm everyone has their uh, speed speed of yeah and they have to overcome the learning curve in my case, in the past, I would probably would have read all these things because it was everything was new to me. Now I'm starting to go into the specifics. So yeah, you'll always have something to learn. So work on that. Okay, so I would recommend you. So what to take to the hospital? Take whatever you feel comfortable with, whatever is accepted, right in the hospital. I would recommend you. It is my my preference to t take 
my own scrubs usually because they have one, two, like three, four pockets and sometimes even the white coat on so I can put this thing folded up with all my papers with uh, my patient. I can put on the other one, the mass, mass gen uh, booklet if I need it. I can put the two pens, my work cell phone, my personal cell phone, stethoscope right here, um, everything. You can put everything in there. If you just have the regular scrubs from the hospital, you, you'll just have usually one pocket here and that's it. So be sure you have enough pockets and that you aren't carrying things all over because if you have to carry things all over, then you're rounding with the the attendant and they're saying something and you have to write it down and you don't have any place to put your things and you just put your stethoscope there and you start leaving things suddenly you just lost a $300 stethoscope and you're pissed off and that may alter your that day's rotation so you don't want that okay okay so I would recommend you these this thing I'm not sure what it, how it's called clipboard yeah it, it foldable clipboard I guess that that should be the name for this thing so you just fold it and put it in and you can find it in Amazon and yeah it's nice whatever color you want okay that's what I would recommend uh, if you have yeah even if you have one patient you, you could use it now I'm seeing that I probably don't even need it but it's nice it's nice to have Sometimes even your attendant needs some place to write and you can be like, here, use this. Okay, what else would I recommend you uh, rotating in the wards? Um, I would recommend you, for example, a way to use notes efficiently that I found efficiently is I write the note, I pen the note, I don't save it because if you sign the note, it's for everyone to see. So maybe you have a lot to work on and that wouldn't be, you might mislead another a consultant physician so I would usually pen the note and you can access that from your cell phone usually and you could go to a section in Epic that says note entry and there is your incomplete note and what I do usually is I mark in the color red any change from yesterday or anything remarkable I would like to mention during the um, rounding, during rounding, because these notes are everything. When everything's like black, you you maybe if you're like me, you read through the diagnosis, and sometimes you add di diagnosis. Sometimes you add hefpef. That's a new diagnosis you're adding. You add the diagnosis. Uh, uh, you you had a, an anemia, which you didn't know what type of anemia now it's a high pro proliferative microcytic hypochromic and possibly iron deficient so you didn't have that information yesterday so what I usually do is I mark these new words new informations uh, in red so when I'm rounding with the attendant I access this if I have time I access it from the phone and I'm like okay so I don't have to mention again that the patient has chronic peripheral neuropathy because the patient's been here more than two weeks. What's new? What's changed? So that's important in the wards. So whenever you're presenting a patient that is new, okay, the whole story. And what's the format for this story? You'll start off saying this patient is a, a 55 year old female with a past medical history of the and the history you mentioned should be relevant to the chief complaint or the reason the patient is in the hospital in the first place so I would recommend you not to do this with a past medical history of arth rheumatoid arthritis cryoglobulinemia um, chronic kidney disease uh, peripheral vascular disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, right? Uh, end stage renal disease or something like that. And they say, oh, and, and the reason the patient uh, is here is because the patient, um, what can we say? The patient has a, an, an abscess, abscess after being being stuck with a with her an, an abdominal abscess after being stuck with her 
uh, insulin, like the insulin, um, what's the name of it? The insulin injection or the insulin thing, right? So it's something that shouldn't, you shouldn't mention all that because when the attendant or all your team is listening to that past medical history, everyone's thinking in their minds like, what can this be in the end? And you're mentioning a huge li list and everyone lost your attention after you said all these 10 diagnoses. So in this case, what you could say is this patient is a 55 year old patient with a past medical history of type one diabetes, which um, has been reusing his or her insulin, um, the, the name of these uh, insulin vials and has had a lump uh, on her abdomen in the injection site that has been uh, increasing in size. Yesterday it became more painful and the reason the patient came is because she had fever and chills and some drainage from the site, period. Okay, the patient's past medical history is blah, 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 blah. Okay, now you say the patient has end-stage renal disease, this, that, all those 20 things, right? Because that is the usual a way in which you captivate your audience and you maintain the attention. So if you were with me in my first month here in the US, I probably was saying the list of 10, 20 problems before saying the chief complaint or saying what was strictly relevant to the chief complaint. Why was I doing that? Because in Costa Rica, we don't have such a structured way of presenting. So in Costa Rica, actually, uh, you present the story with all these, it, you start off saying all that past medical history, then you say family history, social history, and after saying all that, you're saying the HPI. So that's something that I recognize from the U.S. that's my, way better in the U.S. In the U.S., first, in that, those first one to two sentences, you're saying, okay, past medical history that is relevant and the patient is here for this. And then you give more of the context, more of the complementary or adjunctive information that is important. So that's something I recommend you whenever you're doing an admission, be it in the a patient you had to go see in the ED department and the team will get there in 20 minutes, half an hour, or a patient you did a, a long, great, um, history and physical examination and you're going to present because that's a way of maintaining the attention and generating better better ideas and analysis. Um, I would recommend you starting the wards to try also to have an analysis and a plan. So even if you're an intern, as an intern you shouldn't probably the emphasis isn't for you to say these are the pr problems and these are my suggestions of, of treat, treatment, but of course, try to get out of your comfort zone. Try to think of this as if, what if I am the only person that's going to see this patient? Would I just go and say this, tell the story and then go home? The answer is no, right? You would say the story and then you would act on it. So what would you do? And say what you would do and then the attending or your upper residents or even students will tell you, hmm, wasn't, I thought, what about anticoagulating this patient? So it, yeah, you said the CT, you said the CT angio, you said this and that, you thought the patient has a high probability for pulmonary embolism, but why aren't you anticoagulating the patient? So you'll be like, hmm, should I anticoagulate before being sure the patient has PE? So that's when you'll learn and that's when the attendant will tell you, well, if the risk is so high that you're actually considering that diagnosis, you have to anticoagulate and after the exam, we'll see if we stop it. So that's what I'm recommending you to do. Um, okay, so we already talked about the admission, uh, paying attention to that, how to present it, I, something very important I'm recommending you is when you're working on your assessment and plan, remember that in the assessment and plan, you're writing down problems. So transaminasemia isn't a problem. It's a laboratory 
alteration. So yeah, the patient might have increased transaminases, but what are you thinking, okay? So if the patient has elevated transaminases, uh, in the thousands you can, the, you can change that for possible uh, or transaminasemia concerning for hepatocellular pattern of injury. So now you're thinking of differentials instead of just saying increased transaminases, instead of saying troponin leak, instead of saying lipasemia, right? So try to add things up. So if your patient has a lipase that is elevated and no abdominal pain and the imaging is normal, what do you mean by lipasemia? And your lipase is 1.5 times above the upper limit. That's nothing. It just means, yeah, lipasemia means nothing. You can put that under a section that says maybe in other, you can mention increased lipase uh, in a specific or something. So maybe you'll think about it later, but it's not really a problem. Try to prioritize your problems in the problem list. That's something I would recommend you. So for example, you can have a patient that today the problem is ischemic cerebrovascular uh, accident, right? So you can put that as problem number one, but the patient's been there, work, been working, worked up, and the patient also has a heart valve, a mechanical heart valve, and suddenly uh, the patient is improving from the ischemic cerebrovascular attack, and in two days from now, suddenly the INR is 10. So, what's the problem with this? So probably, maybe the over anticoagulation now is problem number one, and the cerebrovascular ischemic attack is problem number two. So that's something I want you to think about. On a daily basis, your problem uh, prioritization might change. Does this take time? Yeah, it takes time to organize this thing. But is this helpful? It is helpful because it is showing that you're able to triage the own problems, the, the, the problems within your own patient. So if you're able to triage the problems your patient has, you probably will be able to triage your patient against others and you'll be able to prioritize. If you prioritize, you'll be able to know where you have to dedicate your time. So one, a quote says, be able to, to pay no attention of what makes no relevance. It's something like that, but it's like a stoic, a stoic um, quote. But ba basically, yeah, you have to prioritize. You have to know that there's sometimes you don't have enough time that you just have to pay attention to what is most important. And sometimes you will even have to delegate some things and even more initially as an intern, you won't be able to do everything. So what's important in the words? Um, as one of my fellow uh, residents said, she said she was told this by an attendant, notes don't save lives. Um, so actions do, right? So yeah, it's very nice to have the admission, uh, the HMP done and signed. But what's gonna save the life is that you, before your HMP, have, have an idea of this patient needs anticoagulation right now. So I'm gonna put in the order right now. This patient needs oxygen. I'm gonna put in the order for oxygen. Okay, so that's more important. So after you do the orders, if it's an admission, the admission orders, if it's a patient uh, that's over anticoagulated, it might be vitamin K, it might be a patient that's bleeding, it might be a transfusion. Sometimes that's more important than you write in a nice note. So be able to prioritize that. So after you prioritize putting in the orders and all those things, do, yeah, write the note. Okay, if all your patients are stable, write the notes. So how do you know if your patient is stable from day to day? So what I recommend you doing is in the sign out, you listen. And if they don't say anything about your patients, it means your patients probably weren't at least coding, right? They weren't unstable, but then go one by one through every chart of your patient <clears throat> and check the vital signs. 
So go to the vital sign tab and just check, okay, how are the vital signs? How is the, was the patient febrile, a febrile? Uh, what's the saturation, oxygen saturation, heart rate, blood pressure? <clears throat> That's very important. So don't go into one, don't just see one patient and stay there and write a full note. What I recommend is go to all the patients and see the vitals and see all this basic information that will triage you into what is the condition of the patient. <clears throat> so after you know the patient is stable or unstable, you'll do what you have to do. So if you see a patient that now has a heart rate of 140 and yesterday had a heart rate of 100, you can be like, hmm, what's happening? I'm going to see this patient immediately. So you tell your upper level or you don't even tell them. You go over there and you, then you tell your upper level. Um, <clears throat> that's what you have to do in the wards. You have to make sure that you have to prevent the problem from happening. You have to prevent the code from happening. So that's the most important thing. Don't just fall asleep on your patients. Don't see a patient that has a heart rate in 140 and just say, okay, we'll see what happens. No, go tell your upper level if you're afraid, right? You might be afraid and you probably are if you're an intern. I'm not afraid anymore because I've had to deal with a patient dying in front of me many times. So I would just go and see what's happening, right? But I would let my upper level know because of course we have to respect also the hierarchy. Um, <clears throat> whenever you have to speak out, be, be respectful, but give your point. So that's something I respect and I learn a lot from. So actually in this rotation with my upper level, uh, my upper level, I, I really respect her. <clears throat> she is really smart. So she would say, no, for this patient, I would start the patient on X antibiotic. And I would be like, why don't we start this out and other antibiotic? I think this and that. And she would be like, no, because I, I'm not sure about nephrotoxicity. So I would answer back, yeah, but this other medication also produces nephrotoxicity. But I think this one is better because of this. So she would be, she would answer back and it would be here and there. Nice. It was extremely academic. I learned a lot. And that's the environment you want to be in, right? An environment where you can speak freely and this is what improves patient care. Not, a, not in a place that you can't even speak up. For example, in Costa Rica, you, I couldn't uh, tell my upper level, like, why don't we give, I could just say like, and why don't we give this other antibiotic and stay shot, right? And the upper level would be like, no, no, that one is, doesn't make sense. It, it won't help, help at all. Um, and I would have to be like, yeah, yeah, and that's it. Because if I would have been like, but wait a minute, this and that, they would start hating me, right? So in Costa Rica, I did, I was myself and I kept on and I was, I did do it. I did say like, yeah, but this other medication, so in general, what happened in the end was like, it, it became tense, tense situations. And suddenly, uh, my fellow residents and upper levels weren't liking me that much, uh, but they didn't understand that it was a matter of ego because we were trying to help the patient and maybe I had something to add uh, on the table, right? So here in the States, you can do that. And if you're in another part of the world, I wish you luck because I understand that it is very hard. Try to not inhibit yourself because that can generate stress and even depression and more when you're trying to help someone out and you know you have an answer and you don't say it and suddenly the patient starts complicating and even dies and you're like if I only would have said that so that's what I'm trying to pass on to you what else in the words always electrolytes always pay attention to electrolytes you will be the one who is uh, fixing that potassium, fixing that magnesium, sodium. So you have to know that. So whenever you're seeing 
ask for the labs you will work on, right? So don't ask for labs just for asking for labs. If you need labs, ask for them. So there are patients you have no idea what they have and this happens that you just have to send a, a CMP, a CBC, a arterial blood gases, an x-ray, an EKG. Yeah, there, if you have no idea and no one has an idea, you have to start somewhere, so send the labs. But after five days, is it necessary for you to send the CMP every day? Probably not. What are you expecting to see on a CMP if you, that you couldn't see on a BMP, right? So if you already have a clear diagnosis and you already saw that on the CMP the only alteration was kidney function, you can see that on a BMP. So send the BMP. So after a week of sending the BMP, do you have to keep on sending that BMP now that the problem is fixed and that the issue is a case management placement issue for the patient and everything is resolved and that the patient could might as, be, as well be home? Don't send the labs every day. Send them every 48 hours. And eventually you might only not even send labs every 48 to 96 hours, right? So be conscious about that because that will also save, save you time and you'll also help the patient out. So be sure to send what's important. If the patient isn't diabetic and you aren't given a, medica a steroid, why are you sending POC glucose every four hours, doesn't make sense, okay? If there's something you're thinking about, even if it's a weird disorder, before you send the galactomannan assay, ask your upper level and tell them because sometimes there are some exams that might be way too expensive or some exams that might even alter treatment. So a patient that <clears throat> you're getting ready to discharge the patient and you just saw a little bit of tachycardia and you wanted to send a D-dimer, suddenly you have a positive D-dimer with a Wells DVT score or a PE or with a PERC rule out score that rules out a PE, right? Or with a Wells DVT score of very low probability and you're sending a D-dimer that ends up positive, suddenly you have delayed care because now you don't know what to do with this high D-dimer. So be sure that if anything you're unsure of, ask. Ask because anyone that's there, it's their responsibility to answer, even if they don't like it. So every upper level that's there with you, they have to answer. And if they're not answering, let your attendant know, okay? So don't, the good thing in the U.S. is that you're never like left unattended. Uh, at least in my hospital, that doesn't happen. In Costa Rica, I was left unattended a whole lot of times. So just to tell you a very short story, the first stress echo I performed was after I saw one stress echo. So I just saw one stress echo and suddenly the second one, they left me there alone and I was doing the stress echo and I was like, okay. What do I do now? And I was with the nurse and the nurse was like, yeah, you're doing it fine and this and that. And I was like, man, what am I doing here? Yeah. Okay. So what other thing you should do? Um, yeah. Pay attention to what's important. Filter out your, your problem list on a daily basis. Uh, diagnosis change. Priorities change. Uh, Try to look for a syndrome. Try to look for something that uh, explains all everything that the patient has. This is called Occam's Razor. And actually, there's a Dr. House episode that's called Occam's Razor. Basically, it's if you have a, pay, a problem list that says problem one, transaminasemia. Then below that, you have um, another problem that says... Uh, abdominal pain, chronic, uh, chronic abdominal pain. You have transaminasemia. And suddenly uh, you have another problem that says elevated, let's see, elevated alkfos. And, and the next problem says diabetes and something else, okay? So you can be, make that become one thing because probably instead of you having four or five diagnoses, you're having one thing that explains all of them. 
That's what usually happens. That's what Occam's razor means. It's basically whenever you have a whole lot of th symptoms or things, usually they can be part of a larger syndrome and that syndrome be part of one disease. That's usually what happens in medicine, not always. So you could actually figure that out and maybe get to the conclusion of a painless, I'm, I'm making it up, but painless a mixed hyperbilirubinemia. So that's a, like a syndromatic diagnosis, right? Painless, iso no, painless, a mixed hyperbilirubinemia or painless um, cholestatic pattern plus abdominal pain. That's different than having these three diagnoses and having these different information for each of these diagnoses. So that's the art of medicine. That's where you're using your critical thinking. Um, so that being said, very important, never trust blindly any HPI you read, even if it's your best friend, even if it's a, an attending um, you respect, because you never know if there's some detail that might have been left out or the patient was uh, oriented in that moment. So whenever you read an HPI uh, that says is the chest pain, for example, all those chest pains, always go ask the patient. So chest pain that radiates to the left arm that the patient feels like uh, there's an elephant foot uh, on, standing on their chest and exacerbates with exertion, right? That's the HPI. So you can present that and just read that and just say, okay, the patient has this pain and an elevated troponin and everyone's already calling cardiology, right? You could just read that and you could also just read whatever the EKG software interpretation says, which is a possible acute myocardial infarction, right? So you have your diagnosis. You have, you're saying, oh, this patient has an NSTEMI, a, possibly a type one in STEMI. But what didn't you do? Well, and you listened to the student and the student went to see that patient today and, the, and you asked the student, how's the patient's pain? The patient is in worse pain. Yeah, but the patient is doing worse. If you just trust on that, that might be a problem, right? But if you go to the patient and you tell the patient with open-ended questions, you ask the patient, can you tell me a little bit about uh, what brought you to the hospital? So the patient might tell you, oh yeah, yeah, so yeah, I've been having this pain on the, like on the right side of my head and it got worse and, and I, that's the reason I came here. My wife told me to come um, because I've already been having something here, but it, it's been going on for years and, and no, it, when I press it hurts, but, but yeah, it's my, my pain is mainly in my head. So that's when you are able to narrow things and you're, you ask, okay, so you told me you have, you have pain, head pain, headache, and you also have something going on here. Can you tell me which of those is a more disturbing for you or worse for you? The patient is like, eh, this one. Okay. So now you're thinking, and now, you might actually have a patient that has a another thing, right? A meningoencephalitis or or no call you test for no call rigidity, Brudzinski, Brudzinski, Kernig, and suddenly you find out that you can have elevated troponins in the context of a cerebrovascular uh, event, right? Things like that. So that's what I'm saying. Don't anchor yourself to whatever someone write wrote whatever someone said always ask open-ended questions so if you read it's very specific i recommend you going and checking it for yourself and not reading to the patient anything that's on the hpi because you can tell the patient can you tell me the reason you came here and the patient will tell you don't you can read it on the file i i, I thought you had already read it a lot of people have already already asked me and it's there on the file you, you can read it so you can do two things you can say oh yeah here it says chest pain no i don't recommend you doing that what i recommend you doing is 
Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, we have it on file. I have already read it, but what I usually do is I go and examine the patient for myself and I ask the, the questions because sometimes there is some information that might be missing and by asking the questions, this might make us discover uh, things that, or yeah, discover information that might aid in your treatment or even avoid unnecessary exams and complications. So that's the reason I'm asking. Uh, is that okay with you? Almost every patient will tell you, yes, ask. Even if they're angry, they'll be like, ask. But ask for the hundredth time. Yeah, I'm ready to answer because you're saying that it might improve something, right? So then you, you ask, okay, tell me um, what's your past medical history, this, that, and tell me why did you come here? Why did you came? Yeah, come, came here, whatever. So that's where you're, you'll figure out your own HPI and that changes things. That might change things. I can't mention how many times in this rotation that changed things a lot. One example is a patient that in the history and physical examination from the ED department said that she was having left-sided weakness and I went there and I was like, there's no left-sided weakness. This doesn't look like a stroke. So, and the student was like, hmm, I, I don't understand. So I, I performed a neurological examination and I did a complete examination, do the finger to nose and suddenly the patient was doing wasn't doing this very well. I asked the patient to come and walk with me and the patient was unstable, the unstable gait and all that, a toxic gait. So suddenly I told the student, this is a, yeah, the patient does have a CVA, but it's in the right cerebellum. And the student was like, right? You, you might be seeing this. I'm, it starts with an R, you're very smart and you uh, thought it was like a great diagnosis, right? Because we're used to in the States that diagnosis are just, let's see what the imaging says. No, you can do the clinical exam. And, and it was very interesting. So this is a right posterior, no, it, this is a posterior circulation CVA, it's cerebellum. I'm not sure if it's ischemic or hemorrhagic because you don't know that on a CT scan, uh, on a, sorry, on a clinical examination usually. Yeah, almost never, even if you're the best neurologist, no way. Okay, so uh, uh, some minutes passed and actually we had the report and the student says, wow, it was that. So that's what I tell you guys, even if you read it on the note that the patient has left-sided weak, left weakness, not necessarily. The other day we had a morning report where the one-liner was, 24 year old female with right lower quadrant pain uh, radiating to the back. So suddenly when one of our attendants said, what diagnosis are you thinking of? Most people said diagnosis just limited to the right lower quadrant, but I added a diagnosis that usually has nothing to do to the right lower quadrant. I talked about pancreatitis, which is usually peri-umbilical, which would be mesogastrium or epigastrium, usually epigastrium. Why did I say pancreatitis? Because it radiates to the back. But actually, um, they told me, uh, the attendant told me, but that's not a right lower quadrant. It, I think it was right lower quadrant pain. Yeah. It, I wouldn't put pancreatitis in my differential. And my answer was, you, I don't trust, I don't trust HPIs, I don't trust stories unless I do them. And it's not because I hate anyone. So even if my, my whatever, I have a cousin that I love, he tells me this is the story for the patient. Unless I ask some questions and I'm 100% sure, I'll believe that. If I have the chance to talk to the patient, I'll usually ask, right? But yeah, there are some people that, of course, over time you get to know and you're like, yeah, whatever this person says, I believe. Yes, that happens. I would do that with my cousin for sure. But there are some people like that you just, you, you don't know who they are. You don't know who did the HPI and you see these characteristics. So my differential was any radiating pain to the back 
or any right lower quadrant pain. So that's why in the end, the diagnosis was pancreatitis. So maybe someone took the history not very well, or you can also have a typical presentations from typical conditions, okay? So that's what I want to uh, say about that. Uh, what else can I tell you? I would recommend you trying to focus, focus on your craft. Oftentimes on the wards, there is way too many people sitting down around you and talking about everything. I would recommend you to just focus on your thing. I take my own headset, so it's around here. It's like a huge set headset. I have a small one and a large one. The large one is the, both are noise canceling, but the la large one really noise cancels things, the people around me. So I probably am undiagnosed ADHD. So, and I, I don't care, I don't want treatment. I have my headphones, okay? So what happens is that I, I am sitting down, working on my patient, and suddenly they're talking over there about, did you hear this patient that they, they have this hemangioma in the, in the liver and the patient is a toxic? So suddenly I'm working on my thing and I'm th and they're and they're thinking about things and I'm thinking about could this be Osler Weber Rendu? Could this be hereditary ataxia telangiectasia syndrome? Could this be what's this other Bar Barlow Lewis Barton Lewis syndrome that is very similar to that one? Not sure if I'm saying the first word correctly. <sighs> Don't remember it right now. But you see what happens? I go in a tangent. I'm talking at a tangent. Most people, if you love medicine, you'll be trying to listen to what they're saying over there. Then you'll listen something over there. And everyone is social, right? So when you have to, you, you can pay attention to other conversations, but when you are finished with your work. Once you finish and focus with your work and you have paid attention to the potassium of your patient, paid attention to what the next step you'll do is, paid attention to all these things you have to do, which usually take a whole lot of time. Um, after that, start paying attention to other things. So what I recommend you doing is put on your headset, put on your, your headphones, focus on your thing. It doesn't mean you don't want to socialize or, or have long lasting relationships with all your peers it just means that if you are the one responsible for your patient and yeah you can just point towards your upper level whenever you want but that's not gonna look good on you so make yourself responsible act as if you're the only one seeing the patient and that's how you'll grow the most um, so in the words I already talked about the electrolytes already talked about how problems can change very important in the wards. Be sure that your patient eats if they can eat. So if, if they can't eat, be sure that you put in the order. But be sure to resume their feeds as soon as you can because one of the worst things for a patient is not being able to sleep, to eat, to do their basic things, right? If they have constipation, if their part pattern is every three days and they've been in the hospital for one day and a half, don't give them laxatives just yet. So take into account things, the things in the uh, own context for your patient. Individualize your patient. Um, so yeah, make sure of the basics. So what are the basics? First of all, your patient needs to eat. Your patient needs to be probably on thromboprophylaxis. Can it be chemical or does it have to be mechanical? If your patient is walking all over, probably doesn't need a prophylaxis but in our hospital uh, almost no patient goes without it but okay you can make your case at least you have to speak about it because if you leave your patient without prophylactic and um, prophylactic uh, anti it's not anticoagulation but prophylactic yeah anticoagulation um, and you don't say anything and do you don't write anything on your on your note if something happens to the patient, you can't say anything after that, right? You have to leave very clear in your, in your note. We are not starting the thromboprophylactic because the patient is walking 
uh, is ambulating, is walking to the bathroom, is um, goes out of the hospital two times a day to visit his, his or her family. It goes down the stairs here and there. Okay, that would be interesting, right? It would make sense. Uh, remember that also. So eating, um, yeah, so the vital signs as well. Another vital sign is peeing. Is your patient peeing? Is your patient having a bowel movement? That's important to know. Um, and the rest is just characteristics of or details of what I've spoken about. I think I have already given you the keys to success. Um, with that, if you have that in mind, I think you can build from that. We can talk about specifics in another in another video but let's see what else we can talk okay from day to day what do you do you can copy paste the note don't waste time on writing exactly everything copy paste your note from yesterday right copy paste and edit it okay so read through everything so read through your physical examination so maybe your bipedal edema in your patient went from two positive to one positive so change that and something nice I would add whenever you change something put a parenthesis and say improving mm, same uh, worsening right so for all those things so that will give you and the team that's coming a sense of okay this is the way we're going so be sure in the interval history section where you write whatever is new from yesterday to today always right is the patient stable or unstable if the patient is unstable you shouldn't be writing a note and just sitting down there right but okay you can write patient unstable went to see the patient immediately blah 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 med team was called this and that that was done okay but if not patient stable how are the vital signs okay so he was dynamically stable a febrile a saturated 98 percent on room air perfect next line patient uh, tolerating PO intake, uh, had a bowel movement, uh, ur urinating spontaneously without difficulty. Okay, after that, uh, new potassium, that's something I add in interval history. Some argue that it shouldn't go there and it should go in the problems list or assessment and plan. I write it in both, but okay. So you have to make that clear, okay? But if there's something new that potassium was normal every day and now it's 2.2 so potassium previously 3.4 now 2.2 period we started on 11 slash 20 slash 22 iv kcl 50 mil equivalents in five hours with recheck at 2 p.m okay so what's important with this? Whenever you're writing down things, you're starting things, you never say, today we did this because you can copy a note and you can drag it today three days in a row and suddenly you don't know when today was, right? So better write down the exact date you start things. So that's an important point. 11 slash 22 slash 22, right? Uh, for, for everything, right? So suddenly your problem list and more as an intern might, might get increasingly big, big, big and huge, right? Because you'll write down all these things that probably aren't even meaningful. So try to go with your upper, upper level and tell them, I'm trying to like filter out and make my problem list more concise with the assessment and plan. So maybe your upper level will tell you, okay, so maybe you don't have to write down what we found on these chest x-rays because all, all of them were normal that will go in the imaging section you already mentioned that so don't mention it now and basically they can say okay but this is important the CT angio was negative for P so write down that okay so you can write the date 11 slash 18 slash 22 CT angio negative for P okay those things can stay in the whole stay for the patient because that will help you when you do the discharge summary so get into the discharge summary my best recommendation is something I haven't been able to do very well I've done on and off but whenever you can start working on the discharge summary and just pend it so it will help you 
uh, when you have to actually discharge the patient. Because imagine having the patient, you've had the patient two days. So on the third day, you, you all have some free time. You're like, what am I gonna do? Work on the discharge summary. So just pen it and you can write down what has happened. So if you work on that daily or every couple days, whenever you're discharging the patient after 15 to 20 days, you won't have to start from zero thinking of like, uh, when was the MRSA swab done and, and what bacterial culture was positive? You won't have to do that from zero, right? So that's it for this video. Uh, Kari is already telling me to go. So hope you liked it. Fellow interns, fellow doctors, uh, Lily and Nana have fallen asleep. Good thing is this is gonna be on YouTube so you can fast forward me and listen to me in half the time. See you in the next one.